So we're going to start with um, the primary and secondary pollutants. So you can find this in your note packet on the third page. So the reason we're talking about smog today is because smog is a secondary pollutant. It's a pollutant that is created um, from the reaction of an initial pollutant with water or air or sunlight, or something like that. So we get pollu pollutants, they're emitted, and those are primary pollutants. If they come directly out of like a tailpipe or directly out of a factory smokestack, those are primary pollutants. Eventually what happens is there can be chemical reactions in the air that convert those pollutants into secondary pollutants. And that's what smog is. Smog is a secondary pollutant. So because our pollutants are in the air, then they react with water or sunlight or something else in the air, and we end up getting secondary pollutants. So primary pollutants are the main pollutants that we've talked about, especially the ones under the Clean Air Act. Because the whole goal of the Clean Air Act was to reduce those pollutants. Remember, N-O-S-C-L-P, NOSCLAP, right? The N stands for what? Nitrogen oxides. What does the O stand for? What's the pollutant that starts with O? Ozone. What is S? Sulfur, sulfur dioxide. C? Carbon monoxide, L, lead, and P, particulate matter, right? And the particulate matter can be PM 2.5 or PM 10, right? And so these are all the primary things that we can control is we can control how much is coming out of cars and smokestacks and all of that. Once they're in the air, we get secondary pollutants. So they react with sunlight or something else, and they create these secondary pollutants that are harmful. You'll notice ozone, this is how we get ground level ozone, is because these pollutants react with sunlight. And that's what that photochemical smog is. You'll also see nitric acid and sulfuric acid. These are the two acids that make up acid rain. So it's because pollutants get converted into an acidic form, and then they end up creating acid rain. So I'll show you a picture on the following page that kind of shows you or illustrates this. Um, but what we end up having is regular pollutants, they go on, undergo chemical reactions, and then they form those secondary pollutants later on. So smog is an example of a secondary pollutant, something that's been converted from an initial pollutant. So if we look at this picture, we get lots of sources of air pollution, right? Natural from volcanoes. Remember we said sulfur. Volcanoes um, are a big source of sulfur, okay? Along with cars, smokestacks, and they emit all these different pollutants. And those pollutants then can be converted to other things. And those other things can have other health or environmental consequences. So we went over natural and man-made pollutants and temperature inversion, and so we're going to flip to the back. You have this written down. What can we do about pollution then? We can reduce the amount of gas that's spilled. We can restrict VOCs, right, lighter fluid. We could reduce wood-burning stoves and fireplaces. That was the reason Mongolia's air was so bad. Restrict auto use. If you live in Mexico City, Guess what? Your license plate determines if you can drive that day. So, for example, um, if your license plate okay, has a starts with a 5 or a 6, or has the last number of 5 or a 6, you can't drive on Monday. 
Got to figure out how else you're going to get to work. Okay. Um, expand public transportation because then people are riding together. Carpool lanes, you might have seen something like this, right, that let you go in a faster lane if you're carpooling. And then just put stricter limits, right? Um, so all of these are just different pollution measures that we can take around the world. We're going to look at smog and smog formation as soon as my computer stops freaking out. And the smog that we're going to look at is called photochemical smog. We're also going to look at sulfurous smog. Oh my gosh. I don't know what my computer is doing. But first we're going to do this. Uh, this is a math problem in your book. So the book has like different math problems embedded. And we're going to try this math problem. So in the U.S., nitrogen oxide emissions decreased from 22.6 million metric tons in 1990 to 17.2 million metric tons in 2005. Calculate the percentage reduction and the annual percentage reduction for nitrogen oxides. So I'm going to give you a minute. See if you can set it up. You can use a calculator. How do we calculate percent decrease? What's the formula? Difference over original times 100, right? So my difference is going to be 22.6 minus 17.2 over the original. And the original is 22.6. So make sure you always find the correct original. You end up getting, is it 22, 23? Did somebody do this? 23%, 23.8 I think is what it is, percent. All right, that's the total percent decrease. What if I wanted to find annually? What would I do per year? Divide by how many years, right? So how many years did this go for? 1990 to 2005, how many years is that? 15, right? So we'd take 23.8 divided by 15, end up getting something around 1.6% per year, okay? All right, so on to smog. Maybe. Photochemical smog. This is smog that's dominated by ozone. So I will use tropospheric ozone and, and photochemical smog as kind of the same things. And we call it brown smog. Do you need to know brown, brown smog as a term? No. But remember, we said it's reddish brown. Look at this picture. I know you're writing down. But, like, that's a city, right? Kind of hard to see. Yeah, it does look like Mars, that reddish brown. Here are the three things that we need. We need NOx, VOCs, and sunlight. So the way I remember it is I say I need NOx. Vox and sunlight. So I don't say VOC, I say Vox because it kind of rhymes. And I'm going to show you exactly how this works, but basically what happens is the chemical reaction that happens between these three, and it ends up producing that photochemical smog. And the reason they call it photochemical is because photo means light, right? So it's smog that's reacting with sunlight in order to produce this big haze. And what happens is VOCs, remember the smelly things? When we have VOCs in the atmosphere, ozone can't break down. Normally, ozone can break down to O2, right? This can't happen when we have VOCs. So we get lots of ozone, and then the ozone mixes with the NOx and with other VOCs, and it ends up creating this pollution. So where did the NOx come from? Well, it comes from cars. Okay, the VOCs are anything smelly. They come from cars as well. And then, obviously, sunlight. If it's a sunny day, we're going to have more of that smog than if it's, like, a rainy day. So what I want to show you is kind of a demonstration of how this guy ended up creating ozone. So you can do this in the lab. I just didn't buy the equipment. And I'm going to show you how we ended up creating this photochemical smog or this ozone haze just by using some 
regular science equipment. Um, so what he has here, I'm going to narrate for you because his voice is really, really boring. He has, let's hit play. So he's got a beaker here. And remember, we need a couple different things in order to create ozone. Let's move this. So in order to create ozone, we need Vox and NOx, VOCs and NOx, right? And so because we don't have any um, sunlight here, he's going to use an ultraviolet light. So he's going to take this UV light, and that's going to be the sunlight, okay? And it's going to create some ozone, right? So he's got this. He's going to put it in the beaker. Now, you can create photochemical smog without NOx, without NOx. So what he's going to do is he's going to take some orange, all right? Orange is smelly, right? And so it has VOCs. And he's going to take some of that orange that has the VOCs, and he's going to put it in here. So he's got his orange, and he's just going to put it inside because we need those smelly things to react. Now, you're going to end up seeing something that looks a little bit different in here, and you're not going to notice it right away. But if you look, compare this image right here to the image of when he just put that in. You see a difference. There's a lot more haze, right? And what's going to happen is he's going to take off the lid, and you're going to be able to see some of that type of smog ended up being created. See how it left up there? Now, again, this is just a small scale, but it's showing you how you can create this type of smog in just a very small beaker environment. So the last thing I want to show you is um, the other type of smog, which is called sulfurous smog, um, which we'll get to. This is a picture of photochemical smog in Los Angeles. Notice in 1968, before the Clean Air Act, and then in 2005, after the Clean Air Act. It's pretty good, right? It doesn't mean that it never gets smog, no. But it's a lot better. The last type is called sulfurous smog, and this is smog that's dominated by sulfur compounds from coal, also called gray smog or industrial smog, and this is the smog that we saw in Mongolia. And this isn't an issue in the U.S. anymore as much because in the U.S. we have the Clean Air Act and our air has gotten significantly cleaner since we've had the Clean Air Act. So that's all we're going to do for notes. I want to show you one last thing and then I'm going to give you time to work on your multiple choice. The last thing I want to show you is we need NOx, N-O-X, in order to produce this photochemical smog, right? We need NOx, we need VOCs. VOCs are present pretty much everywhere. We also need NOx, and we need sunlight. So a sunny day is going to have more of this pollution than a cloudy day. But the big determining factor of where we have this photochemical smog is in NOx.